on the last day of the Feast of Tabernacles, I give thanks and glory to Heavenly Father and Mother for allowing us to keep this holy feast. I hope you receive much blessing of this feast and of the Holy Spirit. Today, on the last day of the Feast of Tabernacles, let us share the Word of God with a sermon titled, God's Blessing of the Holy Spirit. First, let's take a look at the book of Leviticus. Chapter 23, verse 33. The Lord said to Moses, Say to the Israelites, On the fifteenth day of the seventh month, the Lord's Feast of Tabernacles begins, and it lasts for seven days. The first day is a sacred assembly. Do no regular work. For seven days, present offerings made to the Lord by fire. And on the eighth day, today is that very eighth day, hold a sacred assembly and present an offering made to the Lord by fire. It is the closing assembly. Do no regular work. Both the first and last days of the Feast of Tabernacles are regarded as very important days in the Old Testament. Let us see the prophecies about the last day of the Feast of Tabernacles, which serves as a shadow, and its reality fulfilled in the New Testament. Let's look at John chapter 7, verse 1. After this, Jesus went around in Galilee, purposely staying away from Judea, because the Jews there were waiting to take his life. But when the Jewish Feast of Tabernacles was near, let's go down to verse 14, not until halfway through the feast. It was almost halfway through the Feast of Tabernacles. Let's move on to verse 37. In verse 37, it is written, On the last and greatest day of the feast, today is that very day. On the last and greatest day of the feast, Jesus stood and said in a loud voice, if anyone is thirsty, let him come to me and drink. Whoever believes in me, as the scripture has said, streams of living water will flow from within him. By this, he meant the Spirit, whom those who believed in him were later to receive. It is also written in John chapter 7, verse 37. On the last day of the Feast of Tabernacles, Jesus said, If anyone is thirsty, let him come to me and drink. At Jesus' first coming, since it was not yet the prophetic time for the Spirit and the Bride to appear. Father came alone to the earth and said, If anyone is thirsty, let him come to me and drink the living water. But in Revelation, doesn't it say, The Spirit and the Bride say, Whoever is thirsty, let him come and take the water of life? Let us confirm this by going to the verse in Revelation chapter 22, verse 17. The Spirit and the Bride say, Come. And let him who hears say, Come. Whoever is thirsty, let him come. And whoever wishes, let him take the free gift of the water of life. At Jesus' first coming, Father came alone. When he came a second time, God the Father appeared along with God the Mother. This is why the Spirit and the Bride say, Come and take the water of life. Let us look at Isaiah chapter 55, verse 1. Come, all you who are thirsty, come to the waters. And you who have no money, come, buy and eat. Come, buy wine and milk without money and without cost. Why spend money on what is not bread and your labor on what does not satisfy? Listen, listen to me, and eat what is good, and your soul will delight in the richest affair. Give ear and come to me. Hear me that your soul may live. I will make an everlasting covenant with you, my faithful love promised to David. The one who says in Isaiah chapter 55, come to the living waters, can only be God. In John chapter 7, verse 37, it is written, If anyone is thirsty, let him come to me and drink the water of life. Also in Revelation chapter 22, the Spirit and the Bride say, Whoever is thirsty, let him come and take the free gift of the water of life. Thus, the one who says, Come to the water of life, 
can be no one else other than God. Doesn't it mean that only God can give the water of life to His children? Let's continue with Revelation chapter 21. Revelation chapter 21, verse 5. He who was seated on the throne said, I am making everything new. Then he said, Write this down, for these words are trustworthy and true. He said to me, It is done. I am the Alpha and the Omega, the beginning and the end. To him who is thirsty, I will give to drink without cost from the spring of the water of life. In this verse, who is it that gives the water of life? Isn't it our God who is the Alpha and the Omega, the beginning and the end? Ultimately, this means that the only one who gives the water of life is our God. It can never be the saints that give the water of life. The Bible says that it is only God who gives the water of life to all mankind. Then, regarding the Spirit and the Bride, who give the water of life in Revelation chapter 22, verse 17, the Spirit represents God the Father. Who then does the Bride represent? She is God the Mother. It is prophesied that no one else but God the Father and God the Mother will give the water of life to all mankind. Let us confirm this once again in John chapter 4. John chapter 4, verse 5. So he came to a town in Samaria called Sychar. Near the plot of ground Jacob had given to his son Joseph, Jacob's well was there. And Jesus, tired as he was from the journey, sat down by the well. It was about the sixth hour. The sixth hour refers to 12 o'clock in the afternoon. When a Samaritan woman came to draw water, Jesus said to her, Will you give me a drink? His disciples had gone into the town to buy food. The Samaritan woman said to him, You are a Jew, and I am a Samaritan woman. How can you ask me for a drink? For Jews do not associate with Samaritans. Jesus answered her, If you knew the gift of God and who it is that asks you for a drink, you would have asked him, and he would have given you living water. Here, in verse 10, we can see a very important message. If you knew the gift of God, and who it is that asks you for a drink, if she had known who he was, what would she have done? You would have asked him, and he would have given you living water. Again, doesn't this mean that there is no one but God alone who can give us the water of life? Through this, we can realize that only God can give us the water of life. But in Revelation chapter 22, verse 17, we can see that the Spirit and the Bride give the water of life. Thus, aren't the Spirit and the Bride our God? Truly, they are eternal God. God the Father and God the Mother. Now, as for the relationship between the Feast of Tabernacles and the living water, let's look at Zechariah chapter 14, verse 16. Then the survivors from all the nations that have attacked Jerusalem will go up year after year to worship the King, the Lord Almighty, and to celebrate the Feast of Tabernacles. If any of the peoples of the earth do not go up to Jerusalem to worship the King, the Lord Almighty, what will they not have? What does rain refer to? Prophetically, it refers to the Holy Spirit. They will have no rain. If the Egyptian people do not go up and take part, they will have no rain. The Lord will bring on them the plague He inflicts on the nations that do not go up to celebrate the Feast of Tabernacles. This will be the punishment of Egypt and the punishment of all the nations that do not go up to celebrate the Feast of Tabernacles. What is it that we can receive on the Feast of Tabernacles? The feast that is closely related with receiving living water and the Holy Spirit is the Feast of Tabernacles. Wasn't the Feast of Tabernacles granted to the Israelites by God in order for them to celebrate the construction of the temple? 
Thus, the tabernacle and the Feast of Tabernacles are closely related. Let us confirm how the tabernacle, living water, and the Feast of Tabernacles are all closely related in Ezekiel chapter 47. Let's look at Ezekiel chapter 47, verse 1. The man brought me back to the entrance of the temple, and I saw water coming out from under the threshold of the temple toward the east, for the temple faced east. The water was coming down from under the south side of the temple, south of the altar. Here it is written, the water was coming out from the temple. Reading this part alone is not enough to understand what this water is. But if we read the following verses, we can understand the living water is flowing from the temple. Let's continue with verse 2. He then brought me out through the north gate and led me around the outside to the outer gate facing east. And the water was flowing from the south side. As a man went eastward with a measuring line in his hand, he measured off a thousand cubits and then led me through water that was ankle deep. He measured off another thousand cubits and led me through water that was knee deep. He measured off another thousand and led me through water that was up to the waist. He measured off another thousand, but now it was a river that I could not cross because the water had risen and was deep enough to swim in a river that no one could cross. He asked me, Son of man, do you see this? Then he led me back to the bank of the river. When I arrived there, I saw a great number of trees on each side of the river. He said to me, This water flows toward the eastern region and goes down into the Arabah, where it enters the sea. When it empties into the sea, the water there becomes fresh. Swarms of living creatures will live wherever the river flows. There will be large numbers of fish because this water flows there and makes the salt water fresh. So where the river flows, what will happen? Everything will live. Then, what is this water? Since wherever the river flows, everything lives, isn't this water the water of life? What do you think the name of this river should be? It is the river of the water of life. So where the river flows, everything will live. Let's see verse 10. Fishermen will stand along the shore, from En Gedi to En Eglim. There will be places for spreading nets. The fish will be of many kinds, like the fish of the great sea. But the swamps and marshes will not become fresh. They will be left for salt. Fruit trees of all kinds will grow on both banks of the river. Their leaves will not wither, nor will their fruit fail. Every month they will bear, because the water from where? From the sanctuary flows to them. Their fruit will serve for food and their leaves for healing. The water of life saves all mankind. Where does it come from? We can see that it flows from the sanctuary. Through the water of life, wherever the water flows to, all those who are dying come to live. In Ezekiel chapter 47, it is written, the water flows from the sanctuary. Through this verse, God is giving us a very important clue. Let's go to the book of Zechariah chapter 14. Zechariah chapter 14, verse 7. It will be a unique day, without daytime or nighttime, a day known to the Lord. When evening comes, there will be light. On that day, living water will flow out from where? From Jerusalem. Where does Ezekiel chapter 47 say the water flows from? The sanctuary and Jerusalem have a very important relationship. Essentially, both words have the same meaning. God reveals the reality of the sanctuary in Zechariah chapter 14, verse 8. On that day, living water, living water means the water of life, will flow out from Jerusalem, half to the eastern sea and half to the western sea, in summer and in winter. Only who can give us living water? 
Who is the source of this living water? Jerusalem is the source of living water. Then, it is imperative for us to find Jerusalem, the source of living water. God connected all the mated verses in the Bible so that God's people could find Him and come to Him. Let's take a look at Galatians chapter 4, verse 26. But the Jerusalem that is above, where does living water flow out from? From Jerusalem. Here in verse 26, it says, But the Jerusalem that is above is free, and she is who? Our mother. This verse teaches us that there must be God the mother. In Hosea chapter 6, God the Father told us that knowing God is a prerequisite for receiving the Holy Spirit of the latter rain. We must know God the Father. But who else must we know? We must also know and receive God the Mother. Only then can all mankind come to the path leading to life. When people's souls are thirsty, afflicted, distressed, and exhausted, to whom can they go to find comfort and rest? They must come to Jerusalem, our Heavenly Mother. Isn't it prophesied in the book of Isaiah that we can be comforted by Heavenly Mother and that in her we can enjoy peace and rest? Isaiah chapter 66, verse 10. Rejoice with Jerusalem and be glad for her, all you who love her. Whom does Jerusalem refer to? Our Heavenly Mother. All you who love Jerusalem, rejoice greatly with her. All you who mourn over her, for you will nurse and be satisfied at her comforting breasts. You will drink deeply and delight in her overflowing abundance. Where can we find comfort? Jerusalem. This is why whenever the Israelites face some difficult situation, they always pray toward Jerusalem and also worship God in Jerusalem. As we can see in the Bible, this was their custom for thousands of years. Let's look at verse 12. For this is what the Lord says, I will extend peace to her like a river, and the wealth of nations like a flooding stream. You will nurse and be carried on her arm and dandled on her knees. As a mother comforts her child, so will I comfort you, and you will be comforted over Jerusalem. When you see this, your heart will rejoice, and you will flourish like grass. The hand of the Lord will be made known to His servants, but His fury will be shown to His foes. Only when we find Heavenly Mother and realize who she is, can we be saved from eternal death and cross over to life. Today, so many people on the earth fail to recognize God the Mother. Since they do not recognize God, who is the source of the water of life, they cannot find her. However, God has allowed all His children in Zion to find God the Mother. We must share with many people what God has given us by preaching it in Samaria and to the ends of the earth. Through preaching, we are sharing the Holy Spirit with them. Among the teachings that Father gave us, we can find the Holy Spirit movement. We are now carrying out that Holy Spirit movement. When we teach people about Heavenly Mother and lead them back into her arms, what will happen if the water of life flows into their hearts? Doesn't the Bible say that wherever the water flows, that everything will live? Then, we must also clearly understand about the matters concerning the sanctuary. The sanctuary consists of two major parts. When we see the sanctuary from the outside, it appears to be a single structure, but the interior is divided into two rooms. The Bible teaches us that the outer room is called the holy place. The inner room is called the most holy place. 
Let's take a look at Revelation chapter 21, where we can find the testimony about the Most Holy Place. Chapter 21, verse 9. One of the seven angels, who had the seven bowls full of the seven last plagues, came and said to me, Come, I will show you the bride, the wife of the Lamb. Here, the Lamb refers to the second coming Christ. In other words, the second coming Christ is God the Father. Then, who is the wife of the Lamb to us? She is our mother, God the mother. I will show you the bride, the wife of the Lamb. Verse 10, And he carried me away in the Spirit to a mountain great and high, and showed me the holy city Jerusalem coming down out of heaven from God. The angel showed our Heavenly Mother as the holy city Jerusalem. Verse 11, It shone with the glory of God, and its brilliance was like that of a very precious jewel, like a jasper, clear as crystal. It had a great high wall with twelve gates and with twelve angels at the gates. On the gates were written the names of the twelve tribes of Israel. There were three gates on the east, three on the north, three on the south, and three on the west. The wall of the city had twelve foundations, and on them were the names of the twelve apostles of the Lamb. The angel who talked with me had a measuring rod of gold to measure the city, its gates and its walls. The city was laid out like a square, as long as it was wide. He measured the city with the rod and found it to be 12,000 stadia in length and as wide and high as it is long. The angel told the Apostle John that he would show him the bride, the wife of the Lamb, coming down out of heaven. The angel then showed him Jerusalem, whose length, width, and height were all equal. What we must understand through this verse is the prophetic relationship between the Feast of Tabernacles, the Water of Life, and the Sanctuary. God showed Apostle John that Jerusalem has the same length, width, and height. This contains a certain will of God. Let us find out what that will of God is in 1 Kings chapter 6. Chapter 6, verse 14. So Solomon built the temple and completed it. Let's look at verse 15. He lined its interior walls with cedar boards, paneling them from the floor of the temple to the ceiling, and covered the floor of the temple with planks of pine. He partitioned off 20 cubits at the rear of the temple with cedar boards, from floor to ceiling, to form within the temple an inner sanctuary, the most holy place, the main hall in front of this room. It was called the outer room since it is closer to the entrance, and the other room is called the inner room since it is farther into the sanctuary. The main hall in front of this room was 40 cubits long. The inside of the temple was cedar, carved with gourds and open flowers. Everything was cedar. No stone was to be seen. He prepared the inner sanctuary within the temple to set the Ark of the Covenant of the Lord there. The inner sanctuary. What was the inner sanctuary called? The Most Holy Place. And it was how many cubits? 20 cubits long, 20 wide, and 20 high. The Most Holy Place was designed to be equal in length, width, and height. God showed Moses this same layout and told him to build the tabernacle according to the pattern he had shown him. There is no other place except the Most Holy Place that has the same length, width, and height. Then, whom does the Most Holy Place refer to? According to Apostle John's vision in Revelation chapter 21, it refers to Jerusalem. What does Galatians chapter 4 say about the Jerusalem that is above? She is our mother. The most holy place is the most sacred place in the sanctuary. Why did Father say, I follow mother? Isn't this something important for us to consider? Elisha followed Elijah. Joshua followed Moses. Peter followed Jesus. And I follow mother. Today, let us once again think about why Father said that. 
we should also be able to say, we too will follow Mother. With this kind of faith, let us follow Mother until the end and accomplish world evangelism so that we can all enter the eternal kingdom of heaven. According to Ezekiel, what will happen wherever the truth about Mother is preached? Everything will live. On this Feast of Tabernacles, isn't it important that we realize who the source of the water of life is? Ezekiel chapter 47 says that living water flows out from the sanctuary. The sanctuary is specifically divided into two parts. The inner part is called the most holy place and the outer part is called the holy place. The tree of life can only be found in the most holy place. There also are the cherubim and the Ark of the Covenant. What is the significance of the cherubim being in the most holy place? It means that the tree of life must be there. The tree of life resides in the most holy place. The high priest could only enter the most holy place once a year. When we consider just how sacred the most holy place is, from a spiritual point of view, how should we understand the manner in which we serve and honor our Heavenly Father and Heavenly Mother? Once again, I ask you, isn't it important that we consider this? Today, on the Feast of Tabernacles, God has abundantly poured out on us the Holy Spirit of the latter rain. Although you keep the Feast of Tabernacles over 100 times, if you do not realize who Heavenly Mother is, the Holy Spirit that you have received is meaningless. Father taught His children who celebrate the Feast of Tabernacles about Heavenly Mother, the source of the water of life, saying, I too follow Mother. Today, let us ruminate on why Father has given us that teaching and follow the Spirit and the Bride who give us the water of life wherever they lead us until the end. Father and Mother, I ask you to bestow the blessing of the Holy Spirit upon all your children in Zion and allow us to bear the beautiful fruits of the Holy Spirit. Now, let me conclude today's sermon. Thank you very much.